This is the Game to Shoot Off is Microcast on Tuesday, the 2nd of April 2024. I'm James Bachelor, editor in chief of Game to Shoot Off is, and I'm joined as always by head of Game to Shoot Off is, Christopher Dring. Good morning, sir. Morning. Happy, happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday, yes. We uh, dared to have a day off yesterday for Easter Monday. Um, I didn't get anywhere near as much chocolate as my children do, did, but I will definitely be eating it once they're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Before we begin, do you have any more kind of GDC gossip or oh, uh, you know little hints to drop in yeah. that might send? Because like, the the view count on our I don't I don't necessarily know about like listener downloads, but the view count on the YouTube version of this microcast for last week is thousands more than the week before because I said uh, something because you said things up, I said thing I was jet lagged me forgot to put the filter up um, the, <laughs> um no um. Yes. Well, interesting. We didn't even think it was that big a deal. We didn't even call no. it out in our promotion for the podcast whatsoever. <laughs> Someone else found it. Uh, for those that don't know, Jay, last week uh, uh, we talked about Xbox a little bit. We tend to do that. And um, I talked about how a couple of publishers, uh, cut, well, publishers, games companies in, um, in uh, GDC were questioning supporting the Xbox because of the sales and performance of it, particularly outside of the US. Um, and... Um, that got picked up by a news outlet. You don't know what you, X's algorithms change or something's changed with X's. I didn't even realise that it had blown up until Jeff Keeley messaged me <laughs> in, um, <laughs> and said, "I see you in the news." And I was, and I, and I genuinely hadn't um, uh, hadn't realised it. And obviously, I suspect there's lots of angry Xbox fans. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not angry. Maybe they're all calm and serene and re- and reasonable about it. Um, I, I did not see the comments, but I imagine there are lots. Um, but yeah, it did. It, that sort of went somewhere. I think it's worth noting that what people say at a bar or in private at, at GDC <laughs> is not. It doesn't reflect like this in company strategy. Um, I remember no. when um, I remember when uh, the the Switch launched. There was a, I'm gonna I'm gonna and I'm gonna name them. No, I'm not gonna name them. A major Japanese games publisher said to me, and I mean major, um, said to me that so they um, uh, the Switch's cartridges were too expensive and it was too much of a pain. And I'm talking about senior person's company. It's you know it's not it's not it's not it's not the profit on it it's not good enough and all this kind of stuff and you know they they they, they didn't say they weren't going to support it but it sounded to me like they were not going to be all in on it but then they were all in on it yeah <laughs> um, and it was like just because because just because you know certain issues might put them make make them annoyed about something doesn't mean they you know you know people might say they don't see the justify might find it justifiable to support Xbox on day one but you know maybe six months down the line they're going to want to put that game in Game Pass right. Mm. And in which, in which case, you know, in order to put the game in Game Pass, they'd have an Xbox version. I don't think it means anything. Um, interestingly, um, shortly after the um, podcast went out and started news story, a, a major European retailer told me that they were struggling to sell anything with an Xbox logo on it. And, you know, they had had conversations internally about it. But ultimately, ultimately, they just went, well, you know, it's not that many games out there. We can support it. And I think it's worth noting that it's not as big a deal as it used to be. Like, do you remember back in the day when the Dreamcast was dead and... EA not supporting the Dreamcast was seen as a major reason for that. Yeah, and um, and you know the moment retail lost confidence in Nintendo, in the GameCube, in the Wii U was seen as a real blow because they didn't have Nintendo didn't have the physical distribution that they needed to reach a mass audience. That was a blowback. Nowadays, with direct consumer selling, you can do it via Amazon. If you do it your own use via your own site, with thousands of games of quite high quality coming out all the time. You know, we're not competing for just the and the big publishers are actually not releasing as many games as they used to. Mm. It's not that big a deal. Um, it's sort of it's it's obviously a disappointment if you, if your publisher doesn't support you or get your console day one. So I want to caveat everything that I said last week and didn't caveat last week. Um, it was a, <laughs> the filter is the filter is back up. Yeah, it's well, it's not. It's just it was just I wasn't trying to be. I wasn't trying to give. It, I, it's what's really irritating is when anything blows up about from the from the podcast or something I've tweeted or something I said in an article. It's always about Xbox, mm. and it, everyone thinks I must. They must think I hate Xbox. <laughs> but the, but the, con- so. the conversation has been around Xbox for years now. In terms of like Xbox is what. So you've got a piece coming up um, on the site. I think today, if not um, certainly this week. Like Xbox has been trying its damnedest to disrupt the industry. Xbox is is undeniably in third place in the the console race. If the console race is a race, you. Know, Console wars are a uh, yeah 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 they, we know yeah we know anyway. Xbox are undeniably in third place. They are trying to disrupt in different ways. They've started with Game Pass. They've started with you know, the low low entry point of uh, Xbox Series X. S sorry, and as you kind of point out in your piece, like none of this is quite taken off. And the the result is that Xbox, for all the ambition it's done, for all the expense it's put into um, trying to disrupt things, it is still behind. And 
I think a lot of the attention inevitably goes on the, you know the underdog or the third player because it's like right, well, what are they going to do? What are, are they going to are they going to recover or are they going to drop out? The conversation we had earlier this year around like the prospect of more games coming to um, Xbox games coming to other platforms that was we talked about this on the microcast like that that escalated you know the actual news the actual announcement was four games four older games are coming to other platforms that escalated in some corners of the internet to. Xbox is going to drop out of hardware completely. Like, yeah. there's so much conversation about what Xbox is going to do to get out of its situation that, it, yeah. uh, 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 that it's in at the moment. That yeah, inevitably there's a lot more scrutiny. That and the fact that like, Xbox are a lot more open about their strategy at the moment. Yeah, they talk, like, they talk a lot. They talk and, a lot, um, and so well, I mean, the, we report on it a lot. And yeah, it's just, you know, we have, Sony don't talk a lot. They just, they just. Uh, but I, I, I think I've said it. I've said it in the piece you're referring to, and I sort of said it online, but again, I didn't say it very clearly is that um i think if there's something that xbox has i think i think they have tried to disrupt things and they've and i actually think some of that series s game pass um streaming as well that's a disruption they're trying to disrupt things they're trying to grow the industry Hmm. but they haven't quite got the games right and that's the bit that's that's the bit that they've sort of fallen down i'm not saying they haven't made good games they've made loads of good games now i'm the i'm a Massive Sea of Thieves advocate. You don't get a bigger Sea of Thieves fan than me. But um, it, it's it, it's um, but it's the right game to the right scenario. So you've got the Series S, right? Series S is supposed to be a games console that comes out. It's supposed to bring in audiences that perhaps normally would wait a few years mm. right at the start of the console generation. That's interesting. That's an interesting idea. But you need to give them something that they want. You need to go, right, here's the console. It's affordable. And here's, like, here's Halo Infinite. And not only is Halo Infinite the game that launches with the Series S, it is the it is a proper full on the next generation the future direction of shooters like the way Halo One to Three was like complete revolutionary wonderful high quality experience it was a great game I really like Halo Infinite however it didn't wasn't delivered that and it arrived a year late and that's an example of me saying they didn't have anything to go with the Series S you need to have the game to go with the strategy with the, with the hardware or games like Game Pass it's not one game you need to have a regular cadence so Xbox used to say. They needed a game every quarter, a mm. decent game every quarter. We almost got to that point now. In fact, we may have even got to that point now. But if you look at the four games they released last year, Hi-Fi Rush, niche, but absolutely excellent. Yeah. Redfall, I'd still say quite niche, but but but, but not excellent. Starfield, I th- I, great game, clearly. But it, in a year where there was lots of 9 out of 10s and 10 out of 10s, it didn't quite it didn't mm. quite deliver what people would hope for it. And then Forza Motorsports disappointed people, from what I understand. It certainly didn't sell very well. So you've got this thing where like, well, that what, that's not going to do your Game Pass. That's not going to help your Game Pass bit, job. They've still got time, obviously, but there's mm. that there's that question about you know. You saw, here's the thing that I thought was interesting. Phil Spencer did into a Polygon um, um, this week. I think it was with Polygon for all of it, and um, he made a comment about um, other stores mm. on Xbox, and that for me is quite interesting because. Um, it does fit with what Xbox have been saying all along about bringing down those walled gardens. Imagine an Xbox that's got Steam on it, right? Yeah. I know they use Epic Game Store and itch, so I think that was the question. But like, imagine a, a, a it's like a Steam machine, really, but ideally with something that's you know, a little bit compelling. <laughs> Steam <laughs> machines are rubbish, but the but there's sort of this sort of you know PC under your TV, um, uh, Xbox UI with uh, with Game Pass in there, but also you can get your games from other platforms. I think that would be quite a. Um, mm compelling interesting project i don't think playstation would be too worried about it but it, it, it would it would that's, that's X, that would allow xbox to sort of just help distribute its thing that's what we're talking about here now they've got this huge library of games from call of duty down to uh redfall and all this sort of stuff in between and it's like you've got these um uh if they can have a platform that uh, they just need to get it out through as many devices and platforms as they possibly can mm. through mobile stores through game pass through streaming through um through hardware and, and that would be quite an interesting compelling hardware case right the one that has where you, where you that's the dream one games console and it's got all of it on it yeah absolutely um I mean, I think we're, we're veering into the our consoles dead or our generations dead, etc. Conversation which has been going on for decades. But like, I, I was going to ask about um, Phil's comments about like you know potentially getting other stores onto Xbox. Like you say, it absolutely fits with the strategy that uh, that Microsoft's been talking quite loudly about for the last you know five to, five to ten years. Um, I'm intrigued. Like it, it, we were in danger of veering into kind of massive speculation territory, but it really would kind of uh, signal it, it would signify like a really big change in the 
the console space. Our consoles have always been walled gardens. Like just by their nature, they are purpose-built devices to you know by, by platform holders and the platform holders control this really tightly. But there's so much conversation now around ecosystems, and um, particularly in, like the mobile space, we've seen um, Epic has obviously particularly taken on like you know, Android and. Um, iOS, so you know, Apple and Google are trying to kind of open those to other stores. They've got a little bit of a victory in terms of, you know, not necessarily, not necessarily Epic has achieved this, but like the conversation has, has escalated to the point where the EU has demanded that um, Apple open up iOS to other stores as part of the, um, to comply with the Digital Markets Act, which is, I believe, now in effect, um, or certainly if not very, very soon into effect. Yeah. And um, and this back and forth, and Microsoft has been part of that conversation as well. Microsoft has backed Epic in its its trial against Apple, and I believe it kind of uh, backed it in the trial against Google. Like so, Microsoft has kind of made its you know made its stance clear on this. Like so, the idea of then bring you know bringing that kind of that opinion into its own ecosystem, I find really interesting. I can absolutely imagine an Epic Game Store and and an, and an itch on um, Xbox. It opens up the whole conversation of whether or not those stores will be as popular or do as well as, I mean, that also extends to mobile. Like, you know, just because you have alternative app stores, are people going to actually use them? Um, would it create pressure? Again, this is really into speculation. Like, would it create pressure on Sony and Microsoft to, uh, sorry, Sony and Nintendo to start opening up their Yeah, ecosystems? well, I think I, Nintendo's slightly different. I think if you look at PlayStation, Xbox very much feels like a PC. Hmm. A PC that you plug into your TV in many ways. Like, it, it's the game, the sort of games on it they used to be, used to be it didn't used to be the case. It used to be things like Connect and stuff, which was like a very living room style element to that console. But nowadays, it's like the games you're playing on it are the same games you get on PC. Xbox's first party games are all across both. Yeah. PlayStation is mostly like that. There are some elements to it that's clearly built. I think VR is quite a living room friendly product, um, and they've got mm. things like um, the Dual Sense is very much a sort of a, sort. Of, they, they still try. They're still a living room ish, but it's still it's not quite. It still feels very much like a, a not too far away from what Xbox is. Nintendo does feel like hardware. The tech, the hardware that's built, the games are built for the hardware. Like those yeah. two things are oh, tied yeah. together. It's not you know the Switch is not just a means for playing Switch games. It's also where the motion controls are and the tilt is and the touch screens. And mm. Nintendo still um, very much marry that tech tech with. Um, the, the, when I say tech, I don't mean you know the insides. I mean sort of the the novelty element of it with with the software. So it's sort of a um, yeah, those two things go hand in hand. Their games um, are built as much around their platform's form factor as they are the specifications. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I'm, that's that's a very articulate way of that's what I was waffling through. Um, yeah. But the uh, it, it's uh, it's um, but it um, but yeah. So I think it's a little different for Nintendo um, yeah. at the minute. But um, it, it's something that um, whereas, but you know, games console, particularly Xbox, but also PlayStation. Um, it's becoming increasingly like PCs. The game, the biggest games on Xbox and PlayStation are the biggest games that are also on PC. Mm. We're seeing those two worlds get closer and closer and closer. And when you start thinking about how open PC is and um, and the opportunities you have on PC, I think the pressure... And Xbox, you know, trying to disrupt things. What a great way of disrupting the console space by suddenly bringing down its own wall. The problem is, just because Xbox is bringing down the wall, I don't think means everyone else is going to bring it. No. Oh, oh, if you're going to let us... You're going to let Steam be on your console. We'll let Game Pass come on our Steam platform. I don't know. I don't believe... No. That is that's that's. I mean, it, it, it works with cross-platform play. Like that, that was a wall that got brought down, and kind of Sony was the last to move on that. But I, like this is this is actually like kind of a more transactional um, wall. Like uh, uh, Sony and Nintendo, and uh, in my head, particularly Nintendo, will want to keep their ecosystem closed, keep it controlled, yeah, um, and maximize the value. They were they were key. They were key. And I don't mean this in a derogatory way because you know I'm, well, I'm again Nintendo's my console of choice. But they're a they're a kids platform. Yeah, right? they're milk. They're meant for families, and that safety, that that oh, confidence massively. that when you when you, you get that machine and you know it's you know yeah. they're not going to be bombarded with toxicity and it's saying, like well, that's really valuable. Similar like the games that you said like oh wouldn't it be great if you had a Steam on on Xbox? You think about the amount of games that are on Steam like you know the 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 very inappropriate games you get from like a random very small developers. Imagine those on Nintendo, like just Nintendo, which just wouldn't. Yeah, whenever wouldn't we get, get whenever we get something a bit dodgy turn up on a Nintendo platform, it becomes headline news, right? Nintendo, yeah. don't, Nintendo don't want to do that. They are very controlling of their yeah. system, and I know that you know gamers don't like that. But I'm talking as a dad, I do like that. Yeah, 
No, I agree. And right, we're well into speculation here, so I think we should probably. And we're also fifteen minutes into the microcast, so we should probably oh, no. talk about some actual news. Right. Um, no, some of that was news. Some of that was news, but no, there was there was a, a couple of stories I really, I really did want to talk about. Was um, so Thursday uh, we actually just saw like three big, uh, well, two big sales and one slightly smaller sale. So, but you know. Three's a trend. Yeah, two's coincidence, three's a trend, as, it, as the saying goes. Um, there were three divestments, and um, two of them particularly big. So Embracer sold uh, Gearbox, um, Gearbox Entertainment to Tech2. Uh, Sega sold Relic, and Relic is becoming um, an independent studio. I am actually going to read some notes this time uh, from the GI Daily uh, news, newsletter, which you should all be signed up for. Uh, and if you're not... The, uh, the the link to sign up is in the show notes on the audio version. If you're watching on YouTube, a link will now appear somewhere here. He says, pointing. <laughs> Professional podcasting at its best. So, um, Take Two is acquiring Gearbox from Embracer for $460 million. It's now going to be put, operate under the 2K label. Uh, founder and CEO Randy Pitchford is still in charge. Um, in addition to Borderlands, uh, it means that so Take Two now has full ownership of the Borderlands rights. Previously, like kind of had publishing rights, but Gearbox owned the IP. Borderlands is now fully owned by Take Two. In addition to Borderlands, it owns it now owns Homeworld, Duke Nukem, Brothers in Arms, Risk of Rain, and other future Gearbox titles. Gearbox is currently working on a number of um, things. There's six titles in the works, including two Borderlands games. My guess is Borderlands Four and a Tiny Tina's follow up. Two Homeworld titles and at least one new IP. Um, so Embracer, I'll come back to Embracer in a minute actually, but Embracer has uh, said, said that this is the end of its restructure. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, Sega has sold Relic. So thanks to an external investor, investor, Relic Entertainment, which is the studio behind Company Heroes, is going to become an independent um, studio. Uh, as part of this kind of um, cut down of, it, of its Western operations, Sega has also announced that it's going to lay off 240 people across Sega Europe uh, including UK-based developers, Creative Assembly and Sega Hardlight. Um, most of the jobs are going to come across Creative Assembly and Sega Europe. There's going to be a small number of layoffs at Hardlight. Um, there wasn't any kind of mention whether or not there's going to be layoffs at other, other UK studios, like Two Point Studios who do like Two Point Hospital, Two Point Campus and stuff like that. And uh, Sports Interactive, which does Football Manager. There's no words on whether or not there's going to be job cuts there. Um, so yeah, it's the the other the third sale was um, Thunderful has sold Head Up, which is the uh, publisher of Bridge Constructor, uh, Bridge Constructor. Sorry, um, this were they've been trying to sell this since I think like kind of October November ish. They finally kind of sold it. Sold for five hundred thousand five hundred thousand euros to Microcuts Holding, which is a legal entity controlled by Dieter Scola, who is uh, founder and CEO of Head Up. So that's kind of a Management Similar to Sega, uh, Sega, sorry, from a couple of weeks back, it's, it's a company being sold essentially into the hands of someone that run it. Yeah, yeah to get this independence back. Um, so yeah, really big stuff. There. I, I kind of want to focus on Embracer first because Embracer's obviously been big ongoing story. And um, funnily enough, before you jumped onto uh, the, this, into the studio, Chris, like I was writing up, um, there was a webcast after the uh, sale of, of Gearbox where they were talking to investors and they were saying that. Uh, so Lars Wiggerforce, the CEO, said that this is a, this is the end of the restructure. They are ending the restructuring program. They began in June. It finished in March. So they are not looking to sell any other businesses. They've actually apparently had interesting parties coming and asking about buying certain assets and studios at Scat. And they've said, like, no, nothing else is for sale. It's too early to start whether or not they're... Uh, it's too early to talk whether or not they're... Uh, sorry, it's too early to talk about whether or not they're planning to... Um, acquire or merge any other studio. They don't really want to talk about that just yet. I can't find any kind of concrete information as to whether or not it means that the layoffs are over. Obviously, you know, Gearbox has laid off, not Gearbox, sorry, Embracer has laid off like well over 1,400 people in the past nine months. Um, hopefully that is now an end if the restructuring is. Um, but yeah, Gearbox is kind of the final point in what has been a really big story over the past year. Um, I was intrigued to get your, your thoughts, Chris. Yeah, well, it's, it's quite a lot of different elements there. I think it's mm. Gearbox. I think it was always going to be Take Two. Oh um, yeah. I think you know they've got to protect that studio. They've got to, Borderlands is a major IP for them. I'm not sure Take Two necessarily wanted to buy a studio of that size and scale. I don't think anyone needs to really add that kind of headcount in the minute. But obviously, Borderlands is there. Is the, is, is one of the, it's one of Two K's key games. Two um, K actually hasn't had the best run of things. Um, you know, the sports games have done well, but actually. Outside of that, they've not had a great run over the last um, few years. Um, Borderlands obviously a key title for them, so um, I always thought it was going to be them. Nobody, you know, they, Gearbox didn't want to be 
independent. Um, so I think it makes sense that it's they've, they've sort of gone back to they're, mm. they're now company owned. It's all night, all in one place. Um, it feels. I think they have they've had to make some layoffs, haven't they, as a result of the uh, integration? Maybe I, I believe so. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so it, it's it's sort of tricky. It's just whether Gearbox. Um, whether or, you know, I'm just wary of Gearbox becoming 2K's Borderlands factory, right? Mm. Um, rather than you know the growth opportunity that Gearbox perhaps was looking for. Become a, I'm actually I'm actually Gearbox are, uh, concerned about that as well. So like the the webcast I'm listening to with Lars Winterfell was like he was saying that um, when they bought Gearbox, it's because Gearbox had a lot of kind of ambition. They wanted to kind of grow in what they do. They, they I think it's the exact phrase. Like they wanted to, uh, they had ambitious plans to entertain the world. And I thought that meant that through things like the fact they own they own a TV and film studio and they've kind of branched out and they're, they're making the Borderlands movie themselves. Um, but no, he, he said primarily through like obviously like um, you know games and publishing other people's games. Gearbox started publishing third party titles, yeah. and then like they've got new IP in the works. So Gearbox clearly were amb- had ambitions, and Embracer had poured a lot of money into kind of enabling those ambitions. They were about I think he said they were. A, around three years into the six year deal of this is how we plan to grow Gearbox. And um, unfortunately, like everything else that happened around the Embracer group has necessitated yeah. them selling like, yeah. They, and you have he, to wonder whether, yeah. you know, I, I'm not, I don't know, Private Division, is that working out for Take Two? That's, um, a, question. A, there's, that's there's a big a, question. That's, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions around, you know, their last game was uh, Penny's Big Breakaway. They seem to do huge numbers. So I think there's quite a question mark around Private Divisions, let alone Gearbox's own publishing mm. arm. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that Take Two have already that they won't need from this. Um, but we'll see. I mean, Randy seemed quite in, in his quote. Obviously, it's a PR quote. You'd take it with a pinch of salt. But he seems to suggest that it was all about growing Gearbox mm. and that kind of stuff. But I wouldn't be surprised if um, if some of that, some of those dreams are um, may not be uh, followed through on in mm. um, in within this um, when this we're in a within a bigger publisher. Take Two is kind of. Um... One of the many companies I think that's kind of mirroring what's going on in the in the industry in terms of like I'm, th- I'm thinking about, again back to your piece where like the release date is so quiet this year like a lot of you know we've said before like a lot of the conversations around surviving 2024 until we get 2025 Take Two will have a great 2025 because it's got GTA Five and six. you've got things so GTA Six sorry GTA Six it was got GTA Six coming up in 2025 and um, you've got things like Judas we're starting to see um, Judas now I don't know that Judas is 2025 I don't and I'm not saying that Judas is going to be as big as GTA Six but it should you know it's looking promising like Ken Levine's new title it is looking like it's going to be a promising it's going to be a hit there but, will be generations of people that've never heard of Ken Levine as well. there will be that's true, that's true. <laughs> but this is the trouble this is what I mean like like Take Two have got some solid hits on the way but you know. GTA Five Six, GTA Six, he's has been in the in the works for so damn long. Judas has been in the work for ten years. Like, there's an element of you want to enable your developers to take the time it take, you take yeah. the time they require to make the game they want to. But and then you have a business to run. You still need to yeah, keep things Yeah, I, I Take Two is an interesting one because they've got the foundation of that business there. Where they, if the game isn't right, they don't have to put it out. No, right? you know they've got they've got this money coming from NBA. They've got this money from Grand Theft Auto. Um, five that that's a bit right in that case uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 is still doing the business for them as well like they've got this these really successful sort of uh, evergreen games that are just bringing in lots of money for them and if you know if Ken Levine needs an extra year to make his narrative Legos then give him <laughs> an extra year or nine um, so, so, so it's it's, it, it's, it, and it's it's if they have got that capacity I think if you're 2k if you're the division within take two yes I think you're probably yeah. going yeah actually we need to start delivering a bit here but um, yeah, yeah it's, no, it's, it's, um, it's there's that element to it and um, before we wrap up thoughts on Relic going independent um, I found well inter- Relic's an interesting one they haven't really delivered for Sega in, as in the games the games have done fine like Company here and Dawn like, mm. in, and actually probably their bigger hit one of the, they did Age of Empires for um, Microsoft as well um, and so they've, they've been an interesting one I, here's the thing with Sega it's really sad because I, well, how long ago was it when Sega Europe was the crown jewel in um, yeah. Sega's thing you know it was that, that was their digital business. It was Creative Assembly with Total War. It was Football Manager. It was stuff they were doing with um, I forgot the name of the studio that was making that sort of a four X game. And they sort of there was all these sort of wonder. They were growing and they were doing loads of interesting things. And amplitude. Not quickly, it was amplitude. Yeah, amplitude. That's it. Yeah. And it'd be wrong. A lot of those have been untouched by this. But hmm. suddenly now it's. Um, I was actually given a heads up that, that things with trouble was coming to Sega Europe at GDC. Um, and um, because and I thought well, not not more for Creative Assembly, right? You know what a wonderful studio. There's so, so Creative Assembly does so much good for the games industry, 
um, in terms of what they try to do in, uh, in leveling people up and um, supporting. They're one of the few people that support student events, a few publishers, because mm. developers are like, we don't need students, but Creative Assembly are always thinking five, ten years ahead. They are very much ingrained in the ecosystem, They're a very supportive team. I've always great value for um, uh, a great... Um, can't say any nice things enough about Creative Assembly. And they had hyenas didn't work out for them. Maybe we should, we should have seen that coming. Um, but um, and then and they get hit again. Um, Relic going independent probably makes sense to Relic. Um, it's yeah. you know it's it's they're quite similar to Creative Assembly in many respects in terms of the types of game they make, strategy games. Um, and um, and they and they probably you know again their independence um, might give them the freedom to. Um, take those IPs and look after them in the way that maybe IO Interactive did with Hitman mm. it doesn't you know it doesn't it might fit better but maybe um, also kind of like work with other companies as you say like they worked with Microsoft on an Age of Empire on the new Age of Empires like maybe they can work with other publishers bring their yeah, expertise but Creative Assembly work with Microsoft on Halo Wars too right it's, it That's is, true, it yeah. is a, you, we've, we, we, you've seen Sega do this sort of thing but I, I, I will say um, yeah I think it's real, sad, real sadness with Sega Europe because they were really mm. hot property not so long ago and they're wonderful teams they really do the right things um, and um, and to see that that side of the business just get hit hard by what's going on is, is, is a real shame um, but I do think it's interesting that after weeks and weeks and weeks of really really bleak news around closures and stuff and we've still got some of that what mm. we're reporting on at the moment is we've seen investment we've seen companies be able to spin out and find you know find like you know spin out from their company's relic you've got saber before that right and 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 that so it, it, there's some of the news that kate has come out ahead of and just after gdc isn't quite as bleak as the first two months of the year were and I, mm. i'm hoping that's a sign fingers crossed for that i i, I agree i hope that is i hope that's a sign of a better times to come hopefully a, a bit more of a positive summer for the uh for the games industry and um, that is all we've got time for today thank you so much for joining us um we will be back next monday as usual because there's no bank holiday or anything so back to the regular schedule next week and um, if you are listening to this you can listen to it on the podcasting platform of your choice if you'd like to watch us and see the faces that go with these lovely voices we're on youtube um, you can get more news insight and analysis into the world behind video games at games and studio biz thank you so much and we'll see you next week <laughs>